Oh, hi. It's Chris, the Guitar Ramp Tech from Sydney, Australia. Today we're looking at a Princeton Reverb, Blackface. What seemed like it would be a straightforward repair ended up being a little bit more challenging than I was expecting. I reckon you might be able to pick up a few pointers on this video. If it sounds like of interest to you, then hit the subscribe button, then go grab yourself a coffee, pull up a chair, look over my shoulder, and we'll nut this one out together. See you shortly. Now this is interesting. The logo. Tail, which implies CBS. Fender Musical Industries, which says CBS. Post 65, mid 65. Now before mid 65, there was no logo. It was just a blank uh, grill cloth. And that goes back for all of the, the smaller amps. Mid 65 on, we got the uh, logo with the tail. So I reckon we'll find it's going to be post 65, maybe 66. We'll have a look. The black face panel is immaculate. It's just absolutely gorgeous. No major scratches, a couple of a little nick here, which you probably can't see. Um, yeah, both of those jacks are going to get need, uh, these sockets are going to need to be cleaned out. And a bit of marking on the grill cloth, but no tears, just a little bit grubby in places, but no problem at all. The Tolex is immaculate. Bit of a scratch here, bit of a nick here. But that's all I can see. Otherwise, it looks beautiful. Okay, let's have a look inside. Also, here we have the beautiful original Jensen speaker. The date code or the, the, the code on here is 220, which is Jensen. And the uh, following numbers are 540, which means it's the 40th week of 1965 that the speaker was made. Now there's a, a label on the side here, the tube label. And one of the letters is missing, but I can see that the first letter is P. And uh, if you start 1951 being A and count forward from there, um, P is telling us this is a 1966 production, which so far fits in with the speaker code being towards the end of 65 um, when Jensen made that and shipped it out to Fender and uh, the sticker there. So we'll, we'll see what other clues we can find. I'm going to also look at the transformers and see what, no, hopefully they're original and um, we'll have a look at those dates too. But that's great. Um, so this is a USA power supply. Um, obviously in Australia we have to use a 240 to 110 step down transformer. But either way this um, two core uh, power lead is, is not acceptable. So I'm going to rewire it so that it's all nice and safe with an earthed um, USA plug. Now let's have a quick squiz at this. 606, I recognise that as being Schumacher and that is the uh, 1965 made at 606-5 so 1965, 39th week, 1965. The reverb driver is really hard to see. 606 Schumacher, 1966, third week. Power transformer, I haven't seen this code. What is it? 831. So I looked that up and that's better coil and transformer. Uh, the dates right, spot on, 1966, third week. So that would be original. Here's our multi cap can. It's got uh, one, two, three, four 20 microfarad caps in there. Malaroy original from 1965, 30th week. And. Um, Let's have a look at the tubes while we're here. 
Amperex um, 5R3, also known as a GZ34. Then we've got two RCA 6V6s. Let's have a look. Phase inverter is a Mullard 12AX7, very nice. Reverb recovery 12AX7, looks like a GE. What have we got here? Another Mullard 12AT7 reverb driver, looks right. And V1, what have we got there? Oh yeah, it's a um, uh, RCA. 7025 looks great. I'm going to test all of these. What a great original setup of valves. So let's hope they're all nice and strong. Might as well check the fuse while I'm here. Normally I would halve the um, current rating in Australia because we've got twice the voltage. But because we're running at 110, I want to see a one amp fuse there. Which we do, so fuse is good. Okay, let's have a look at the flip side. When I catch up on my repairs, I'm going to make myself a little chassis holder, but until then, I'm just going to use my little wooden blocks that I made many years ago. Okay, so we can see here we've got the original Malaroy brown caps. Normally I would change these for a gigging customer, but um, because he wants to keep it original, we're going to just test each one and make sure there's no leakage, which we can tell partly by looking at. This one here has bubbled, so I'm going to have to change that one. I'd rather not, but we'll see. I'm going to test all of these caps in here this multi-cap can and there's our rectifier capacitor no visible leak but we'll check it for ESR what ESR what's that I think I better tell you a little bit about that I might do a little video on ESR and how to check it and why it's important Another thing that's unusual about this amp, adds to its rarity, is the fact that uh, the circuit identifier for this is an AA764, which good luck finding a schematic for that. There's the more common versions, but um, fortunately, Uncle Doug, if you haven't found Uncle Doug's channel, you've missed out on a lot, look him up. Uncle Doug came across this oh, six or seven years ago and um, he went through the same thing about does this AA764 really exist? So a German guy who runs a website called Blue Glow um, agreed that there was no existing AA764 but the variations between this and the 1164 were quite minimal so he very cleverly did this schematic which shows the changes and according to this there's just two changes it uses the GZ34 which is a, a much better tube than a 5A, uh, uh, 5U4 and uh, another cap that's changed in the tremolo capacitor which would be that fella there so um, we'll be working off that schematic and here is the death cap. I don't know if you can see that there. Blue cap, nice blue molded. I'll disconnect that and disable this ground switch. Okay, this here is a dual cap. It's got 225 microfarad elements. A cathode bypass cap. I'll show you that shortly. So we'll just simulate that by doing these two
I got these from my US supplier of parts. Um, I like to support our Australian distributors as much as possible. Sometimes I just need to get stuff from the States. And um, it's 25 plus 25 that does our two uh, cathode bypass caps. Where are they? Uh, one here. Oh. One here and one here. But look at the size of it. They're, they're, they're quite expensive, but I can't use it because even compared to the original, it's huge. So oh, they're just staying in there. So I persist with doing this little twisty thing. It works great, but you know, I just thought, oh, I'll get something which mirrors the original as much as possible. Now I'll just snip this off, noting that the negative is at the junction of these three resistors here, which is going to be the earth point. And then we've got these two coming up here, which are going to the cathodes. I wonder if I can just... Bend him down a bit like that. bit OCD about getting it all nice and straight. Got my identifying labels up the top. Dip him into my little flux. And you can just straighten yourself up there a bit. Hey, that's better. Let's just, just double check that joint. It's a beautiful thing. These last two caps, I love these blue molded caps tone wise. Not a huge fan of the ceramics. They tend to be a little bit noisy. Um, but um, these I do like. But I will check these because these are, especially these two, are really important because they're going off to our power tubes. And if these leak, they're going to throw the bias out and I'll show you on a schematic why and how. Um, so these have to be absolutely no leak at all. Well, it looks very original. I love the way Fender did this. Look, this is the way it should be done. Look at that. Yeah, there's our filament windings, all twisted to try and minimize noise, all nice and high away from any of the signal carrying wires. Beautiful. So you've probably heard about this term ESR, which is equivalent series resistance. So let me just give you a, a brief introduction now, and then I'll cover it a bit more in another video. But uh, an e ESR, equivalent series resistance, if a capacitor in its ideal form is like this, it just has, it, as you know, it sort of it blocks DC, and it'll pass AC from there to there. However, it is the real world <laughs> and uh, this doesn't exist. So we're going to have a resistance which appears in series. Now, obviously, 
we want this to be close to zero because if it's zero impedance it's going to be back to where the uh, ideal is. And there's also more often than not a parallel resistance which we're hoping is going to be infinite because we don't want there to be a shortcut for the DC to get to the other side of that capacitor. So this is our series resistance and this is our parallel resistance. Why are they bad? Um, if we say that the capacitor has got a couple of jobs, and one of them is to be a store of energy and a block of um, AC in our filter, then we want this to be zero. And so we'll measure that. You can get yourself an ESR meter. I can't remember how much this was, but it wasn't too expensive. Also, uh, in a, the role when a capacitor is as a coupling capacitor between stages, you don't want there to be any leakage because sometimes that coupling capacitor could be going to the grid of the next stage, which is meant to be negative. If this is coming off a resistor that's tied to, you know, uh, 400 volts, and this is let's say 100k or something, obviously we want to block that totally because this has to be negative in respect to the cathode. If there is a parallel resistance leakage, then this pathetically little negative voltage, which is anywhere from 1.5 volts negative to let's say minus 35 volts negative, if all of a sudden there's a path for that 400 volts to get to the grid of the following uh, tube, we've got a major problem because that's going to slam this thing positive. That tube is going to be busting its guts to transmit everything it can. It's going to red plate if it's about you. All right, so let's start measuring some of these ESRs. So here's a little ESR table I found online. And then this is just me actually measuring from my own collection of tubes uh, as to what they should be. So obviously in an ideal world, they're zero. And as they increase, it's, um, it's going to get more and more failure. So this is sort of like the highest levels we want to see. So another reason why um, having a high ESR is not good is that, as you know, when you pass a current through a resistor, it generates heat and heat will slowly start to deteriorate that capacitor even more. So once we have a high ASR, the deterioration and ultimate failure of the capacitor is inevitable. So this is why we, we check this, especially if we're thinking about keeping it in service. All right, so these are all 20 microfarad. Hang on, let me do a, a zero on this first. Just hook these up, short those. You notice how short the leads are. That's to make sure we avoid excessive resistance and capacitance in the leads, because this is also an excellent low impedance measuring tool. You can use it for measuring very low resistances. Okay, so here's our first one. So according to my little table, this is uh, 20 microfarad at 450 volts. So we want to see something less than two according to that chart. According to my uh, F and T, it's uh, less than 1.6 or 1.13 for a Sprague. We got 0 0.61. First one, oh, let me just, I don't think it really matters, but I'll, I'll get the polarity colors right. It doesn't really matter because I think it's injecting a, a high frequency, low, yeah, low uh, voltage. So 0.6 is fine. We're looking for something under 1.2, 0.57, nice. 0.8. 
0.683, it's good. Okay, so we're going to call that multi cap can good, which is pretty bloody amazing when you consider how old it is. 1966, what's that make it? Uh, well, it's not quite as old as me. Um, it'd make it 54 years old. Wow. Jeez, they made things good. All right. Let's check onwards. Oh, here's another. Let's check our bias cap while I'm here. That's negative, but that's okay. And 0.4, that's good. This is 25 at 25. 25 at 25, you want to see less than a half. Okay, that's, it's not great, but not bad. Yeah, look, Jesus, if it was me, if it was my amp, I'd be changing it. But it's a cathode bypass cap, so I guess if it fails, it's just going to, you know, lose top end, lose gain. But, you yeah, know, it's probably twice as high as I'd like it. But I'm, oh, shit, that one's definitely gone. Hang on, let me just measure it across there. Yeah, well, man, these are these are all. I don't know. I I will respect the wishes of the customer. Were it me, were it my amp, I'd be changing them. But he is more of a. Uh, he's a player, but he's not just not a live player, so. I have to respect his wishes and I will not change those. Well, let's have a look at the cathode resistors. These are carbon comp ones. They uh, are known to drift quite a bit. So we're going to look for pin three of tube one cathode resistor. Should be 1.5, 1.65. Then pin eight is here. Drag him down, there he is. Perfect, 1.56, that's good enough. Tube 2 is our reverb driver, so we've got both cathodes tied together. Going to a 2.2, which is uh, here. Uh, what's that? That's 10%. That's fine. The cathode resistor and the um, plate resistor are going to be virtually the same, if not exactly the same, on a uh, cathodyne phase inverter, which is what we got here. Okay, look, I think they're okay. They're all, some of them, but quite a few of them have drifted upwards. Um, but in respecting the, the owner's uh, desire of keeping it as original as possible. We'll leave all those in place. Next thing I'll do is I'll change the two wire mains lead into a three wire lead, make a ground connection, bypass this switch, remove the death cap, wire it so that it's legal. Uh, in Australia we need it to go through the switch, the active to go through the switch and the fuse. The neutral I'll take directly to the transformer and then I will think about doing that negative feedback uh, in and out of circuit using the no longer required ground switch. But one step at a time, let's get rid of this old wire first. I'll just show you what I've done here with the, um, the three pin socket. So it's coming into here. Uh, I've used the uh, existing two four, uh, sorry, 110 AC outlet as a joining point. So I've got the neutral coming in there, going straight to the transformer. The active comes there, goes all I've tucked the, the wire along the back there, goes to switch, switch go, power switch, switch goes to the fuse, fuse then goes to the transformer. 
So it's now legal. We're fusing and switching the active, which is what is required by law and common sense. I've made a decision to change this bias capacitor here for a couple of reasons. One, it, it tests out okay. I just checked the um, capacitance of it. The ESR was okay. It's supposed to be a 50 microfarad and it's measuring at 80. In theory, it's okay. So it's, it's a negative supply, which is why the diod looks backwards and the positive is going to ground. So if this fails, part of the job of a capacitor, a smoothing capacitor, is it, it will end up increasing this negative voltage. Because um, without that, uh, just a half wave rectified is not going to give us that much DC. But with a nice size cap, the negative DC goes up. If that fails open, a negative DC is going to drop. Our bias is going to change. These tubes are going to cook. If this fails short, we suddenly go from minus to zero, which is a lot more positive. Once again, these tubes are going to cook. So this is a really critical element. And if this is one of the old germanium diodes, I'll have a look when I get in there. I'll, I'll swap that as well, because this is a really important part. Well, we've got 50 at 50. I'm going to put in 100 microfarad at 100 volts. I want a nice stable negative supply. Okay, so let's just check this uh, rectifier diode for the bias supply. If I check it this way, I should read open circuit, non-conducting, which is what diodes do. This way we should read about 0.6 of a volt forward voltage. There we go. So that diode's okay. I'm going to leave it in place for the sake of originality. If it were mine, I'd be changing it to a 5408, but I'm going to leave it in there. It's testing okay. Let me just check those two resistors here. There will be a... where are we? We want to see around about 100k there. And a... Oh, looks like 27k there. Here's a 27. 28.6. There's a 100. 107, so it's 7% out. Okay, we may need to tweak the bias. So we'll do that just by adjusting one of those two values. Going to be using an F&T 100 microfarad at 100 volts. It specifies 50 here, but um, I'm happy to use 100. Just going to give it a bit more smoothing. And um, I reckon Leo would probably have used 100 if he had them. So we're going to do it. Just turn on my flux exhaust fan. There we go. Works a treat. Now I think we're going to check the uh, power tubes. Two lovely old 6V6 made by RCA. And you want to see according to my little ready reckoner here, somewhere between 15 and 35 of plate current. So we'll call that one 21.2. And the next one, whoa, uh, bugger. 42.3, bugger. Oh, I better ring the customer and say these are not going to be usable. So I've managed to find some old Russian military tubes, you know, um, I'd say they're probably 70s or 80s production. I've tried these before, they sound great, so I've put those in. Haven't heard them yet, we'll see. 
Now before I put any power on I'm going to bring it up slowly on the Variac but I'm just going to draw your attention to this. I mean you know that uh, you have to have a speaker load um, on your output transform when you turn it on you know that. But look at that. So, so we've got that valve driving that primary stage of the output transformer. Secondary side needs to have a load. Okay remember that. Because look at what we got here. Doesn't this look familiar? We've got this tube. So we've got two of the um, uh, plates joined together. 12 AT7s, nice high current device. And it's driving the primary side of that reverb driver transformer. The output of that, the secondary side of that transformer goes off to the reverb unit. So this is also exactly like this. It needs to have a load. So it is probably a good idea to not leave this unterminated because I've got it away from the cabinet now. So I'm now going to put a load on there. So what I've done is I've bought myself a bunch of cheap RCA connectors and I've just labeled them 150, 1K, 560, and 10 ohms. So this is going to be a low impedance that that, uh, that reverb driver transformer is going to be expecting. So I'm going to use my white one, the 10 ohm one. So now we have to figure out which one of the two reverb sockets, the in or the out, is the one I need. So I can see a 220k there. We're going to look for the 220k here. And there's a 220k resistor just there and that's on the return one. So it's on the other one that we're going to put our 10 ohm load. So not on that one but on that one which I would call reverb send but Fender calls it reverb input. I've now got my bias right hooked up to both of the 6v6s monitoring the plate currents there but before I do that let me just check these voltages make sure they look good and where are we here's our plate voltage 414 oh yeah uh, 410 so it's pretty close to exactly spot on. Now let's just check the current going through each tube. So tube A is 27.0. Tube B always a fair bit higher, 33.2. I'm going to switch those tubes around and measure those again. This time A is 32.0, B is 26.4, it's 20% difference. No, I'm pulling them out. Not happy with that. Sometimes I just think buying new old stock is just a waste of money. These were allegedly matched by the seller but when I measured them on my maxi matcher it was 35 milliamp and 28 milliamp. I mean that's not even close. It's about 20% which is what we saw once we put it in the uh, instrument. So that ain't going to work. So I put in a pair of tongue soles. I like these. They sound good, new production, reliable source. And let's just see what this is like now. So we've got 26.8 on one tube, 26.5, no, 26.7 on the other. Well, it's rare that you see such a good match. So you've got to say, why would you bother with new old stock? You know, 
it's just a rip off. Anyways, um, let's see how that biases up. So that's on a uh, uh, plate voltage of 420. Here's my little calculator. Four twenty by uh, twenty-six point eight point oh two six eight. Eleven point two five six watts. That's pretty bloody hot. And getting hotter. I think we we're just about to red plate then. So we, the bias started to get away from us then. So I'm going to check whether these coupling capacitors are leaking. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lift that leg there and there and just measure that voltage there with the meter tied, uh, with the meter grounded, the other side of the meter grounded, the voltage side there. So there'll be very high resistance in the fluke meter, but um, there should be still something to reference at the ground. But if so, if I'm seeing it floating up, I'm going to be replacing these two. So let's have a look at these capacitors. You may remember from the beginning I gave you a little sketch that looked something like this. Now we're going to check to see if this resistor exists, the RP resistor in parallel. We want this to be infinite so that this can do its job of blocking. But if we've got any resistance there at all, um, we're going to have a leak and it's going to cause us a problem. Right, so here are those two capacitors and you can see they've got 220 ohm resistors there. That's them there. And so we're going to lift the caps from that 220 end. Just out of curiosity, what's on the other end? 190 on one, 78 on the other. So pretty much exactly what we expected. Either one of those leaking through would be enough to kill it. I mean, it's showing as minus 35, but I've, got, I've taken the tubes out, so there's nothing there. All right, let me just drain these capacitors. You may have seen my little elaborate draining tool, which has got a 100 ohm resistor in here. And I've put a fuse in there just in case there's any dopey buggers around here who turn the amp on and forget that they've got this still clipped on. And I've blown a number of resistors in forgetting that. And since I put the fuse in, I've never forgotten it. So typical, isn't it? So first thing I'll do is I'll just check the resistance on the meter. If we see anything, they are for the museum. Yeah, that looks good. So this is me putting my probe on the output of that capacitor. And I don't think that's going to cause us any grief. What about this one? Okay, I don't think we've got leaking capacitors, so I'm happy with that. So, let's put those tubes back in and have another look and see what's going on. Now I've got to reverse this process, turn it off. Drain them, drain the filter caps. Always, always, always drain your capacitors before you even think of going next to it. And do you even check, trust that? No, of course you don't. 
So you're going to check to see how those voltages are sitting. Well, I'm, I'm happy about this because I do like these and so I'm happy that they're staying because our signal passes right through these. So they are pretty pivotal to the sound. And changing them to anything else, even other good capacitors, may change the sound. Whether you'd notice it or not is another question. So now I'm going to adjust the bias of the amplifier. And you remember that this the, the grid needs to be more negative compared to the cathode. Cathode is, is grounded at zero. So we need to have a negative voltage, about minus 35, it's saying there, for a voltage of 410. So what we're going to do is adjust this resistor here. So if you can imagine that we do a short circuit across that, we short it, that's going to drive that to zero, which is going to be incredibly hot. So we want to go away. So I'm going to increase this resistance. So to do that, I have lifted one of the legs and I'm introducing a series of resistance in my decade box. And we'll just increase it until we get a, uh, a current that I'm happy with. And I'm going to check it on the oscilloscope as well. Because we were running those tubes a bit too hot. So I've got here, save doing the, the math all the time. I have a little chart that I've made up, which is just quicker. So I've got here, for example, for a 6V6 L4, both 12 watts for um, about 450, I think we were seeing, 420. We'd be wanting to see something around about 16 or 17 milliamps, about 420. Now you can see, we, remember we said we were looking for something between, like around about 17 milliamps. You can see these tubes are running a bit hot. So let's start increasing this resistance. And um, we'll re increase it so it's got 270. Let's just start increasing it. Oh, there's, oh okay, that might have even been too much. That was taking it up. 10k. Yeah, okay, I'll put him back. Let's take it up. Yeah, I'll let you have a look up here, what I'm fiddling with up here. You can't see the current readings now, but. So 3K is taking it 21, 19.18.8. Let's just check our plate voltage because as your current goes down, the voltage, plate voltage will be going up. So that's 437. Let's have a bit of a squeeze here. 437, so it's somewhere in here. So we'll be looking for 16 to 17 milliamps. I like it at. Some people like setting it a bit hotter, but I like it around here. So 17 milliamps. Oh, look down here again. So that's 5K in series. Okay, now what's our plate voltage? Four twenty seven, four twenty seven, four twenty seven. We want about seventeen milliamps. Okay, look, that's pretty close, but let's check it with the oscilloscope. Now I've intentionally cooled the bias down so we can see 
crossover distortion and there it is so what we're looking at is that kink as we cross the zero line as one tube is handing over to the other we want that to be a nice smooth transition if we're seeing a kink here it means that um, it's too cold and one's having its rest cycle while the other one's picking it up but there's an overlap and we don't want an overlap there we go that's become a bit more obvious but I'm, I'm reaching clipping there so I want to just stay there so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to slowly warm up the bias for that to go getting better that's where we had settled on before but it looks like it actually wants to go a bit warmer all right that's a little bit um, warmer than we had so let's just take it up there we go there's clipping and that's happening with number six on the dial which is probably not bad so it's pretty clean I've got a hundred millivolts in there so it's a, a strat and there we go so that's at seven and it's just starting to get ugly from there on in well ugly uh, distorted so maximum clean I'd be calling around about there which is 10.9 volts RMS 10.9 by 10.9 it's going to be about 120 118 divided by an 8 ohm load 14.85 watts bang on the money I need to now put in a series resistor there of 4k all right let's see what we got that's close to 4k let's just check that theory of the voltages being a bit too high 120 And that's a problem like in these days when this was done US power was 110 now uh, American power supplies are up 120 so we are accurately reproducing what's in the in the US right now but it's running this little Princeton just a bit too hot if I change the rectifier we're going to be changing the the current draw because I can't remember the exact figures. I think the current draw on a, on a GZ34 is about 1.9, I think, amps, and a 5 year 4 I think is around about 3. So it's, it's a fair bit bigger strain on the power transformer, which I don't really want to do. Right, I checked the um, RCA manual, and um, yeah, GZ34 draws two amps a 5u4 draws three amps so that's just too much for the power transformer a 5y3 is going to drop that plate voltage a fair amount and it draws the same amount as a gz34 so i'm going to try it you're back so where have you been god said you were going out for a coffee and you ended up coming back hours later anyway I'll show you what I've been up to so sadly this had to go it was leaking DC where are we that cap there was leaking into that tube and the bias was sort of just getting higher and higher and higher so it had to go so that's where that orange drop is sitting there um, I normally would have changed that one as well but the customer is very particular about keeping the originality so we respect that and there's a pair of 220k's here where are we uh, there bias comes in 
here and then it splits into that 220k to that grid, that 220k to that grid, which uh, are these two here. And I measured both of them because I just couldn't get the bias exactly the same between them and it was just driving me nuts. So um, this is all that's happening while you're away. So here's why. The other one was spot on 220k and this one 253. So I checked through my stock of my Alan Bradley, you know, new old stock 220k carbon comp resistors. All of them have drifted, never in a circuit. And they're all, you know, 240 to 260. So um, I put in a metal film resistor. It's 220k, spot on the money. And um, the bias is now spot on with both of them. And stable. We don't have that drift. Now the other problem we've got, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. So we've got twice the problem in Australia that you might have in the States. But this amp is 66 when the voltage there was 110 and the um, the the uh, plate voltage um, is 410 volts and you can see there but it ain't in practice it ain't it's a lot higher if we look at that plate voltage now It's 416 now, and I'll tell you how I got it down to 416. I had to take out the 5R4, the GZ34 um, rectifier tube. As much as I'm a fan of that tube, it's just too efficient. And the plate voltage was something like 440 volts. And it was just cooking 6V6s, which if you read the specs, they're only good for 350 volts. And as it is now, we've got it running at 416, so, but it's a hell of a lot closer to the 410. The other problem we have is our step-down transformers. Um, step-down transformers generally come from China. China, for some reason, seem to think that our uh, supply voltage is 230, and it's actually 240. If you look it up, it probably does say 230, but it is in practice 240. So when you wire a transformer to go from 230 to 115 and you bring it up to you know 240 that 115 is now 120 125 which is just way too high for a 110 volt amplifier so we were cooking tubes i've lost two tongue soles and a jj <laughs> and um, then once i put the 5u4 in as you can see we've got our voltage pretty close to the spec it's still a bit higher but Interestingly enough, after this AA764, um, the next revision of this exact same amplifier comes out with the 5U4. So I don't think we were Robinson Crusoe in having that problem. I think Fender probably discovered that it was just too hot for a 6V6. So all is good. Um, the other problem that we had was the uh, reverb unit. Um, it had just had this really brrr sort of really short reverb, just annoyingly short. So um, put in a new reverb tank, sounding sweet. So I think it's time to put this back together and um, we'll give it a listen. And this time when you go away, don't go away for so long. All right, I'll be right back. Stay there. I can see you're looking for the door. No, don't, don't, don't. Say, okay. Well, there's a bit more involved in that than I thought. Um, Anyway, it's sounding absolutely sensational. I'm going to go grab my guitar, have a listen, see what you think. If you like it, put a comment down there. If you've got any questions, um, put them down there. If you've got any comments, write them down and I'll answer each one. All right, let me just grab my guitar and I'll be right back.
wow, I hope that came across okay on your sound system because here the sound was phenomenal. It's amazing what comes out of us. You can see why these things are just so highly sought after and prized. The sound is amazing. And uh, I've only got it on volume three and uh, it just sounds sensational. So I'm very happy with that, as I'm sure the owner will be. And I hope to catch you on the next video. Don't forget, give me a thumbs up if you liked the video, put a comment down. And uh, if you've got any questions, let me know. Otherwise, subscribe and I'll see you at the next repair video.